<clears throat> All right, I expect we'll have a few more people trickling in over the next few minutes. Uh, that's generally what we see happen over uh, the, the start of these. And so I'm going to get things kicked off here and introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, my name is Jason Strait. I'm here with the PASS Cloud Virtual Chapter. Uh, we basically cover things that are going on in the cloud, when it's whether it's um, the Azure VMs or SQL databases or what have you in the cloud. We're going to be uh, covering those topics over the next uh, uh, weeks and weeks. Uh, this week, we've got best practices for SQL Server on an Azure VM with John Miner. Um, he'll be going through, well, basically best practices with a Azure VM. Uh, just to give you a little background more on the um, user group here, we do have meetings about every week. And um, coming up in the next few weeks, we've got topics on Power BI, uh, machine learning, SQL database, uh, from a number of different uh, speakers in the community. Uh, this virtual chapter is part of the PASS community. Uh, the PASS community does have coming up here at the end of the year the PASS Summit. Um, if you are interested in going to the PASS Summit and have not yet registered, uh, we do have a discount code that you can use, uh, VC15CHB6. Uh, that will get you $150 discounted off of your registration. Uh, the PASS Summit is pretty much the best data professional uh, conference out there that you can uh, go to and attend. Uh, lots of professional sessions out there. Uh, lots of opportunities to network and lots of after hours activities so that you can get to know other people in the community and uh, form those bonds to help solve some of your problems in the future. The past virtual chapter is part of a slew of other virtual chapters that PASS has uh, helped us organize and put together. Uh, there's everything from women in technology to SQL Saturday nights to Chinese, Spanish, Russian, you know, the topics cover different subject areas, like in memory, through languages, through different times of the week in which people may want to see uh, virtual see virtual um, sessions and get to know more and learn more about SQL Server. Some of the sessions that come on and that people will see is in the professional development this month. There was a uh, session by Brent Ozar on being a good well guide to being a consultant. There's the sessions that we have here. There's an Excel BI that's doing some 3D mapping. And so whether, regardless of what you're looking for from a virtual chapter, you will probably find it either coming up in the next few weeks or months, or maybe it was in the last few weeks since in their archives. You know, many things out there that you can check out and see. And with that, I'm going to actually pass things off here to John. And let me get the uh, presenter changed. One moment. All right, and with the introduction, I'm going to hand things over to John, and John, it is all up for you now. Excellent. Thank you, Jason, for inviting me to speak tonight. <clears throat> My name's John Miner. Um, a little about myself, I've uh, been part of PASS, the community, for a good five to ten years. Uh, I've been running the chapter in Rhode Island. Okay, that's where I'm, my, uh, I live in my hometown. And... Um, for five years, um, 25 years in the industry. Um, some of the things that I've accomplished within that 25 years is a Microsoft Certified Professional. Um, I had the MVP award for two years. Um, my blog is at www.craftydba.com. Uh, once in a while, I don't do as much as I used to. I tweet, and you can see me at jminor3. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about SQL best practices on Azure SQL VMs. Okay, so I'm going to maximize this if I can figure out how to. Here we go. Perfect. So um, again, what is best practices for Azure SQL VM? Well, one of the things I like to do when talking about something is you know, bring up Wikipedia because there's a good definition out there of what's going on, right? And, you know, some professionals put out definitions. And so cloud computer companies out there offer services in three different flavors, right? And the complexity in terms of management goes from high to low, okay? So the first complex uh, um, type is infrastructure as a service. 
we call that IaaS, okay? And basically it supplies the consumer with a virtual machine. So uh, it gives you the most complexity of management, but it gives you also the ability to do what I like call a lift and shift. So if you have something that's local, okay, a workload that's in your data center and you actually want to put into the cloud, then IaaS is the way to go. Uh, the second type is platform as a service, and basically that supplies the customer with an application development environment. So you can write reports or you know pull data sources together. And the next slide we're going to talk about examples of each of these. And last but not least, the lowest complexity and basically just an end user of an application is software as a service. Okay, and so. What services are there in Azure today that actually represent those three definitions, okay? Uh, Power BI has been catching on. Microsoft's been pushing a lot. So if you use Power BI dashboard in Azure, okay, it's software as a service. You really cannot do anything with, you know, the disk. Um, you just basically, you know, move data, you create some reports. The next one is Azure SQL Server database, so Azure database, okay? And that is a platform, okay? So you can say, hey, I want to spin up a database of standard size, you know, one or standard size two, and gives you so many data processing units. But again, you do not have fine control of the firewall. You don't have fine control of the disk system, okay? And the last one is Azure Virtual Machines, and that's infrastructure as a service. And again, if you're looking to take an on-premise workload and push it into the cloud, that's where you want to go. And that's where you can get the possible what I call the lift and shift to the cloud. This is a diagram I found out there. Someone did this, but um, it gives you just an overview again of cloud services versus package software, right? So if you install package software, then you have networking, storage, some servers you have to do, some virtualization if you decide to use it, OS, right? Any middleware, say uh, some type of queues, runtime, data, applications. And you can see with the coloring that the infrastructure as a service, uh, what you're responsible for which is in green versus what the vendor is taking on um, actually um, decreases what you're responsible for when you go from infrastructure to platform to software okay so again um, you know we're going to be talking about infrastructure and uh, you have to be a little of a jack of all trades you have to be a DBA you have to be a little of a uh, system administrator and a little network administrator if you're going to do something complex one of the things I like to do is give you a presentation overview of what we're going to talk about so you have a baseline of, you know, what you're going to get out of this, okay? So what we're going to talk about is how to design a virtual machine, okay? And once we create the virtual machine, we're going to access the virtual machine because um, if we create a machine we don't use it, it's, um, you know, it's not of no use. Uh, nice thing about IaaS or Azure is that, guess what, if you spin up a machine, you use it for a few days and you don't like it, you can destroy it and rebuild it. So it's really easy to do. In fact, um, I am on the East Coast uh, and Jason's in the Central uh, time zone. And so not even an hour ago, I just built a uh, SQL Server 2016 RTM developer uh, on uh, Windows 2012 R2 and it took less than 10 minutes. So I just put my options in, did click, went and, uh, you know, took a quick shower because I was working outside and came back and boom, it was ready done for this uh, presentation. So again, design the virtual machine, so you're going to have to tell it, you know, what type of disk, you know, name, user, so on. Access the virtual machine, you're going to configure the window settings, okay, because again, once you get it out of the box, it's just like a regular on-premise machine. It's not configured, okay. Um, tuning of the database engine or setting up the tempdb, the min memory settings, the max stops, very important. Uh, one of the things I always like doing because I used to be a consultant is to actually install database mail because you want to know what's going on uh, with your server. A lot of times as a consultant, um, you know, you didn't have the budget to go ahead and buy, you know, those packages out there from different vendors like SQL Sentry or Idera. And, um, you know, if you install the database mail, you can basically get basic alerting, okay, and that's enable alerting. Last but not least, um, 
as any good DBA, you want to you know provide maintenance plans. Um, the two phases of maintenance plans are updating uh, statistics and index reorganization, as well as doing those backups for the possible restore. Okay, um, again, if you don't have that restore plan in place, uh, you know it could be a bad day when things go wrong. Last but not least, why would you want to take a system baseline? When you start going to the cloud, you're starting to share resources with other um, systems out there, right? So under the hood, you know, I don't know what's going on in Azure, but some type of Hyper-V, and you're just a guest OS on a host, okay? So you're sharing with other people, and if you have something called a noisy neighbor, okay, so someone's bang banging, you know, this big transaction load through, and your system's really, you know, down in the dirt, um, you can actually show it to uh, the Azure team. Maybe, um, you know, you can put a ticket in, say, hey, I want to be another rack or something. You can always migrate it off. Um, there's an option in uh, Azure to do that to another server. Obviously, I have to do some downtime. But again, the baseline will definitely tell you whether or not, you know, when you brought the system up and uh, today when you're running it, if there's a big difference in uh, performance. One of the things you have to worry about when um, creating a virtual machine is the compute considerations, and I have the big faucet over there, right? So the question is, you know, connect into the internet. You, a lot of people call them the internet pipe, right? So uh, how big is the pipe that you need to actually get to the internet, okay? So maybe you're just using your regular Cox or Comcast connection. Uh, business type if you're a small business or maybe you want to spend the extra buck and say hey I want to express route okay which is a dedicated backplane route uh, right to the dock fiber of the data centers for Microsoft okay where are the data centers located well that's a good question right there are 22 data centers in the world right now and they're continually adding stuff. In fact, they're continually uh, changing a lot of things. In fact, the next question is how much processing power does your solution need? Uh, and why I talk about that is how many um, CPUs and how much memory, how much RAM. Um, they keep on coming up with different uh, models. Before, there used to be five different ones. Uh, we'll go through them later, but they just came up with a new one called F which is an F-series uh, solution VMs. Um, they're not available in all uh, data centers. One of the things I want to do is spin up uh, something up in a north central area, and I noticed that uh, some of the things that uh, would be a recommended uh, type, which is a DS-series uh, VM, wasn't available. Okay. Last but not least, the security. Um, you can extend AD, okay, your on-premise AD into the cloud, okay, and this talk's not going to go into that, okay, it's just best practices for SQL Server and configuring the VM. Uh, another way to do it is um, you can do SSL, so if you want uh, a secure connection to the database, you can definitely get that, okay. So those are all considerations when you actually design your solution for the cloud and move it to the cloud. Okay, so let's talk about designing a virtual machine. So we talked about the basics of, you know, the ideas behind this, and now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty of actually picking some things, okay? Uh, when you design a virtual machine, you need to specify a unique machine name, some type of admin credentials, okay? So username, password, uh, again, a machine size, so we can talk about that. Storage count. Everything in Microsoft revolves around storage accounts, and that's where these um, images, the BHDs, uh, any type of disk systems, it ends up at a storage account level, and that will end up pointing to some type of data center. Okay? We'll talk about availability sets, okay? and there's two types of uh, domains you need to worry about with that. Um, whether or not the actual machine can talk to, um, you know, just other machines out in Azure, or can you uh, access it through the internet, okay, is whether or not enabling public access. Uh, not only you can use, uh, like I said, Azure, uh, you know, integration or Azure AD, but uh, for Windows credentials, for you can also have standard security, which is a username and password. And again, if you go with standard security, make sure you use SSL. Uh, two 
interesting things that recently came out with the virtual machines is uh, automated patching. Okay, so you can select that. Okay, one would think, oh yes, it's going to patch the OS, and no, it doesn't patch the OS. It just patches Windows. Okay, they let you do the own patching of the OS. Okay, the reason why Microsoft actually picked out for that uh, is because. Um, you know, you might have a vendor product that needs a certain level of uh, patches, okay, and they don't want to dictate what's on that OS. Uh, last but not least, automatic backups. Uh, there is now a automated um, actual um, service, should I say, installed that runs the automated backups. We can talk more about that. Um, you can also do your own backups, okay? So if task one is basically to design a virtual machine. So before, whoops, skip. Before I started talking, I actually went ahead and spun a machine up in Azure. Let's, let's go to that. So we can see that this machine, okay, let's go to close out of here. Okay, so basically I have a Visual Studio Enterprise. Uh, it's basically your uh, MSDN subscription, which you usually get $150 a month. I have a regular, uh, I did a little article for MS SQL Tips uh, on uh, table partitioning in Azure, and so we have something called this database, but that we're not going to get into it. But the main one, which should be here, unless it fell off my grid, it's way over in the corner. There we go. Oops, slide over right here, is our IaaS 2016 server, okay? And so if we double-click that and I pinned it to the dashboard, we can look at some stuff, and it automatically you can see that nothing's really happened except for when I spun up the server. So I spun up the server, and there's a lot of spikes when it was actually configuring it, and since then it's been really quiet, and we can go ahead and look at the characteristics, for instance, properties. If we go with the properties, it has uh, basically, we can see it's an East U.S. location, and um, that's about it. So let's go and take a look at what I did behind the scenes to actually spin that up. Um, because this is an hour presentation, we're already 18 minutes in, I'm going to do the um, Easy Bake cooking type thing, which I'm going to go through a bunch of screenshots, and then we'll actually do uh, some type of demo. So we can see right here that once you're in here, okay, this is uh, the Azure portal, what you want to do is you want to go down, and right here you can see there's add uh, virtual machines, and there's the classic and virtual machines. You want to use the virtual machines because that will use something called the resource manager. Uh, once you add, there's a ton of different machines out there. Type in SQL Server, and you can pick the one that you want. Okay, I picked, again, SQL Server 2016 running on Windows 2012 for uh, the OS. Next one is the basics. So the basics is there's going to be four tabs you're going to fill out. The first tab is basics. You need a name. So mine was SQL 2016, username, password. Uh, again, you want to pick a resource group. Okay, this is where I talked about the size, okay, and again, we'll get into best practices, but the best practice is, is to actually do a DS size, okay, and that means that you're using solid state drives. You can see these IOPS, the way through the roof, you can see right here that if you do a DS3, okay, that you're getting uh, 12,000 IOPS, okay, and that's good for a server if you want to have high performance. You can also specify additional um, storage accounts, okay? And so again, you want local redundant storage, so LSR, and you can pick the premium, or we don't want geo redundant because it's going to actually slow down SQL Server, okay? Um, the virtual network, one of the things we talked about is virtual networks. We're not going to get into that for now. We're going to stay high level. But just to spin up a machine for you, you can. I use the nomenclature of uh, some type of two-letter prefix, the word, uh, the number four, and then whatever I'm spinning up. So this is virtual network for IS 2014. If it was a uh, resource group, it would be RG. If it was a storage account, it would be SA. Okay. And availability sets. Again, I'm doing AV, uh, so this is going to be availability sets, AS. 
and uh, you can have update domains and fault domains, okay? So again, this gets back to how high available do you want this, okay? You really cannot have any high availability unless you have two servers, right? One server doesn't really give you high availability. We'll talk about this a little later, and uh, on the slide, I'll just give you a quick intro. Update domains means that um, if I have two servers, okay, I'm gonna put one server into uh, one group and one server in another group. So when I go ahead and do that patching the update, I'm only at most going to patch and reboot one server. So if you have some type of availability group, okay, with one as a primary and one as a secondary, okay, and you did an update domain like this as well as a fault domain. Now a fault domain means that something physically happened, like someone tripped over a wire or the power went out on a rack, okay? That means that you'll have two different racks and you'll have two different hosts, okay? So that means that uh, the chances of uh, either the power going out or an update happen at the same time to take your uh, application down is pretty small. So that's why you want to create availability sets. Uh, if you're doing a standalone server and this is like a TS3 app, then none of this is in consideration. SQL Server settings, okay? So remember we talked about connectivity? So we want to select public connectivity, okay? We can give it a port. Okay, uh, this is where it gives you a change to actually do that good DBA practice of masking it to a different port if you want. You can also turn on SQL authentication, and again, it replaces uh, J minor, which would be my uh, account to log in, and the same password. Okay. Um, the two things I talked about were new, which is automated patching and automated backup. Okay, so if you do an automated backup, you have to give it another storage account. Okay, and what that will do is it will do your backup stare again. Uh, that you're gonna have to look more into details on that. It's a set time job. Uh, I don't know if it's like daily, full, and hourly logs. You'll have to look into the details. If you want fine grain control, then again, install all hologram scripts, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Storage configuration. Well. Out of the box, you'll get some storage, but if you want to add more storage, right, we can um, go ahead, right? So, for instance, the DS model is still going to give you one terabyte of storage. Uh, you can do two types of storage optimizations. We'll talk about those uh, farther on, but there is online transaction processing, which suggests a different block size versus data warehousing, okay? Last but not least, if we did the basics, we did the size, we did the settings, and we said done, and it gives you the prop, just like when you do a regular install of SQL Server and you push the button, guess what, you're gonna get a server, okay? So next thing is to access. Let's get to the slide deck. So we talked about designing machines, right? Um, we'll go over some of the stuff and then go back to accessing virtual machine size. So I went over that and said DS size. There's actually five sizes right now, okay? A size is your basically your bottom basement size, okay? It's a low end, um, decent processor. You know, for instance, I've used uh, A7 watt. It's relatively cheap. Um, I think it came with what? four PC, uh, CPUs and um, seven gigs of RAM, and it's great for, you know, putting your developer version of SQL Server on. Uh, the D series, okay, um, have higher compute power and temporary disk performance, okay? There's always a temporary disk when you spin up these VMs. It's called the D drive, never use it. Every time the system gets rebooted, that goes away. So again, um, never use it. As for placing your uh, databases out there, never put them on any of uh, the OS drive too. That's another place you don't want to put them on. You want to create your own solid state storage and we'll talk about attaching uh, external drives soon. G-Series, um, this one has the most memory. So if you have a memory intensive application, say um, Hackathon, if you're doing in-memory processing, maybe you're doing a tabular model, something that just chews up memory, right? Then a G-Series is good. Uh, both the D and G-Series, what out on S, they're basically on spinning disks. And again, we know spinning disks versus SSD is slow. So if you want something that's faster, they have a comparison, GS and DS, which means that they're solid state disk and you'll get the speed. Again, like anything, um, you know, 
the faster it goes, uh, the more you're going to pay. Fault and update domains. Again, fault domain is uh, basically a bunch of machines that are on the same data rack. They have a common uh, power source and switch. So if you want to make sure that you have a tier one application on uh, a Azure IaaS v VM, then what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have the, at least two tier, like I showed you. Um, update domains, again, you don't want the same machine being patched at the same time on the same host because uh, you know Microsoft will be patching the host and when the host reboots guess what all your guests go down. By default there are three fault domains and five update domains. Okay, um, Sometimes it's really good especially at my old job before I came to Microsoft I was working for a local um, partner and what they specialized in is SharePoint. And SharePoint has usually like three different types of uh, servers. You have SQL Server, obviously, and if you want it really high available, uh, you would have your availability group or some type of clustering, right? So that's your first set of, you know, similar machines you would group into a availability set. The second would be like your uh, application, right? So your web front end. So um, that would be another availability set. And the last but not least would be a processing. They called it batch. And that would be another availability set. So if you were doing like a SharePoint, um, you know, farm in the cloud, you'd have three availability sets. Okay. So performance best practices, let's talk about that. Uh, this is from a white paper from Microsoft. Uh, the links are at the end. I got the links for everything I'm doing today, so they'll definitely be there for you. Uh, if you're doing the SQL Enterprise Edition, you want a DS3 model. If you're doing the standard of web, it's a DS2. Okay. Um, you can uh, upgrade machines when it stopped from one model to another. Just remember that um, if you go something that goes from spinning disk to solid state disk, more than likely the OS is not going to be upgraded to a solid state disk. Um, let's talk about storage account. First and foremost, you want to use premium storage, right? Because uh, you want it to be really quick. Standard storage is the storage that's using spinning disk, and it's only for dev and test. Um, keep your surge count in your SQL Server VM in the same region. That makes sense because um, you know they should be. Otherwise, you'll have you know some type of network um, problem there. Um, disable your Azure G of redundant storage on the account because you do not want to slow the machine down, your SQL box down by having Azure replicate stuff. This is second page of best practices. Uh, when you add hard disk, you want to use a minimum of two premium disks, okay, and you want to allocate one set of disks for log files and one set of disks for data and temp DB, okay? And again, remember I told you avoid using operating system or temporary disks for database storage or logging? And here's some interesting things. You can enable read caching on disk holding, hosting the data files in TempDB. And I'll go over that when we add a data file to the VM that I spoke up. And you do not want to enable caching on uh, disk that hosts the log file. Again, the log file is um, single threaded and you definitely do not want to do that. If you want more I.O., you can do um, something called um, storage accounts, and you can do a stripe set. And when you stripe a bunch of disks together, obviously things go a little faster. There is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if you had a single disk that got 500 IOPS, and you put four disks together, you will not suddenly get 2,000 IOPS. Uh, maybe you'll get 1,000, 1,500 in the area. Uh, there's a bunch of people have done uh, tests on this. Um, but the allocation size is the most important. Back in the day, before uh, Windows 2000, you had to do partition alignment, and um, there's a white paper on that. But nowadays, um, just make sure that you format your block size correct. Okay, so for all TP, you want 64K, which is 8 cents, and for your data warehousing, you want to have um, 256KB. Just like on-site, on-premise, 
databases. There's certain things you have to do. And this is where this comes in. Uh, basically, instance file initialization is really important. Enable lock pages in memory is really important because that will, um, you know, make sure that the memory that's actually allocated to the SQL VM will not be, you know, captured by Hyper-V by any other guess if some type of thrashing is going on. And again, I know I skipped over instant file initialization, but I'll tell you a little about it. Um, that's the process in which, you know, when you extend or allocate a file, it say if you allocate a terabyte file, it wants to go ahead and zero all the terabyte with zeros, basically. Um, if you enable this with the service count that runs on SQL, guess what? It's going to skip right over that process. Um, database file changes. Some things you want to do for just some performance, uh, enable database compression because things go faster when things are compressed. You can read more things into memory quicker. Uh, limit or disable order growth on the database. I That's something that's in white paper. It's debatable. I have order growth on mine. Again, though, unlike, um, you know, s uh, on premise, you're going to have smaller disk here uh, because you're going to be paying for them. And so having it limited or some type of monitoring on the disk would be really good. Um, disabling auto shrink on the database is also good because you do not want to sh shrink the databases. Again, fast disk. So basically use the SSDs if you can. Um, the error log, the trace files can go to a data disk, um, set your default backup in database locations, and again, uh, apply any of your service packs if you have any for performance fixes. Okay, so this is all the stuff that has to be done for configuring Windows settings, and we'll get into this now. So we're going to add data disks in Azure, enable recaching for the disks, Add a log disk for Azure. Align the disk. Um, don't need to do that nowadays. In all the systems you had it, but nowadays you just need to format it. Um, we're going to talk about setting the power to high. Configure your local count for services. Uh, add the count to volume maintenance. Add the count to lock pages in memory, and configure the firewall row. So so far we talked about we did. Hey, we spun it up and everything is grand, let's actually do something. So now what I did is to connect to the actual server, you can go to, let me show you how to do this. If you haven't done it before, let's close here. What we do is you go connect, and what it's going to do is it's going to want you to save it a RDP session. Okay, so I'm going to cancel because I already have one configured. And then an RDP session, one of the things I always do is go into here, and you're going to have to put the computer name, so that's going to be uh, IS for SQL 16 slash J minor, so that's my user account and computer name. Or, and then what you want to do is in a local resources, I usually check off the drives. If you click off the drives and hit drives, this is going to show you local drives to the server, and so you can copy stuff automatically. It'll show up locally, and I'll show you that in a minute. So I've already done that and connected to the server, so we can see this is actually the IS to SQL 2016 server I set up. And we can see that J minor is logged in, and the version is RTM. So we successfully built that server, and now we need to configure it. So let's see if I can do this. I am going to, I don't know if there's a way to minimize this. Okay, is that go? Oh, it just goes to a different side of the window. It doesn't go anywhere else. Okay, so um, if we minimize this, and go here, we should be able to show you that um, this is the C drive that's local to the actual VM, but by actually checking off uh, that box on IDP, I actually have access to my laptop. Okay, so I can copy things over from my laptop, which is really cool, right? So, one of the things we talked about is, let's minimize this, go back to it, is add data disk to Azure, right? And there's uh, two types, right? So let's do that right now. So again, you're going to be, when working with this, you're going to be inside the portal as well as inside the virtual machine doing a bunch of work. So settings, okay. And then the settings, what we want to do is then add a disk. So we can do a disk by just clicking this. 
And what we can do is this is the default disk, which is one terabyte. So let's add two disks, one for log and one for data, right? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do 2016 and I'm gonna do data. And I'm just gonna make it a small disk because I don't wanna. And remember things we talked about, there's read-only caching, there's none, right? So we talked about you can have read-only for data, okay? And then we talked about having none for the log. And let's double check that because again, so again, uh, might be one back, okay? So right here, void enable recaching for the data disk in tempdb and no caching for the log files, okay? So just double checking myself. So we go here, we hit okay. And this is just like, any VM. Anytime you do something in Azure, and what it's going to do is it's going to say, hey, I'm doing it, and it, actually it's done. So let's do another one, and this one now we're going to do is the log file. Okay. So log 128, and what we're going to do is this one was none. Okay. So hit OK. And now we should get a log file down here. And did finish. Okay, there's a the log file. So, okay, let's go to VM. So, one of the things you have to do, like I said, is be a jack of all trades on this. So, one of the things we're going to have to do is bring up, and I always just like typing it. So, comp mgnt.msc, it's the computer management. Right? And so, this is system administration task, right? Disk management. Okay, so basically it says, hey, I found two new disks, right? And I want to do something. So you must initialize them. So we can initialize them? Sure, why not, right? And now this is where the formatting comes. So again, uh, Disk 3, I'm assuming, is the data, and you could do this, figure this out later. But uh, we can see properties, and let's do the format. So, new simple volume. Next. Okay, so it's the full volume. Sign G, it's fine. Next. Okay, perform a quick format. Uh, let's do this as data. Okay, and so remember this allocation size, this is what you could do. So we could do 64K, and we could do your 256, which should be in here somewhere, I don't know why it's not, but you could just type it in, I'm sure, or the default. So we're going to take the default, which is good enough, but uh, if you were doing OLTP, and it defaults probably to 64K, we'll do 64. But if we're doing, again, something with data warehousing, it's 256. So next, finish, and while that formats, hopefully it gives it back, we could do the next one. Hey, Jason, is there a hot stop at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock? No, we can go a little bit over. Okay, because uh, there is a lot of stuff on the, the to cover, so I just want to make sure. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yep, no problem. Okay, so while this is going on formatting, I'm going to go back to the presentation and keep on talking. Okay, so showed you how to do that. This, okay, so what we want to do is add a data disk. We want to add a log disk. We want to format them, and we want to set the power setting to high, okay? By default, what's an interesting thing is that the actual power setting, and I don't know why that is, uh, this must be doing not the quick format, so that's why it's going to take a long time. So I'm going to hit cancel, and for this demo, we'll do. That's why it's taking so long. We're just going to perform a quick format with 64K and hit OK. Is that quick? Hopefully. Okay. So the power setting is under your control panel. So if you type control, it'll bring it up. And one of the things that's interesting is Microsoft still has this. It's it's more from like the laptop days in which you wanted balanced power versus high performance. But under power options, it's always balanced. 
um, it's basically not going to give you the best performance for your VM, so you want to put on high performance. And again, you can check it again once you set it, so control, I always do it. And hit it again, power options, right? and now we're at high performance, which is awesome. Second thing is, um, when you do this, there's no firewall rule, actually, to connect to this, okay? So if, for instance, we went to this um, disk, so if we tried connecting remotely to this, you would not be able to get in at this point. Let's type control again. Let's see how this is doing. So temporary storage. So that's your temporary disk which I talked about. Right? And then your F drive. And then there's a new drive that's G. And then is unallocated, so we'll do new simple volume, hit next, same thing I did last time, boom, uh, give it H, why not? And then we can go ahead and do a quick format, and we can do 64, and we'll call this log. Hit next, finish, okay. So that's gone, so let's do the firewall rule. So people cannot connect to this right now, even though it's 40.79.43.244, can't get to it. And I'll show you how you, to test that, right? Just bring up SQL Server Management Studio. I have 2014 version of uh, just the tools here, not a real database. And so what we can do is we can copy that IP again. So 40.79.43.244. 4079, 40, 79, 43, 244, comma, 1, 1433. Try it, and I do J minor, and let's get the password. I think it's right here. So, 12K, paste it, and we hit connect, and this should fail. Da, 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 da. And what we're going to do is, I know it's going to fail, we're just going to move on to the firewall rule. So then control, yep, and you hear it failed, so control. Firewall rule is going to be here, and what we're going to do is under advanced settings, okay, under advanced settings, we want to bring it over, we can do inbound rules, okay, and I know there's no rule there, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a port, right, next, and we know it's TCP IP, and it's 1433, Right. And I'm going to go next. And we'll allow connection on everything. And we're going to call this SQL Server Access. And hit finish. Okay. So now, if we go back here and hit connect, hopefully this works. If I got everything right. If not, it won't. So that's done. That's done. We have our G and our H drives now, and they should be formatted, so we should be able to see them. Uh, format disk, format, I guess it's still formatting. Okay, close. Okay, close, close. Okay, so let's talk about next uh, Okay, let's see if this IP is right. Da, 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 da. 749. Da, 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 da. Okay. And settings. Okay, right now I'm looking for the IP, so um, I am going to go down and look at properties and make sure that what I'm putting is correct. And so, looks like I was using the wrong IP because this one says 4079432444. so 40.79.233. 43, I think it was 43, dot 244. Let's do it again. Double check. 
40, 79, 43, 244. 40, 79, 43, 244, J minor, connect. This doesn't work. I'm sure there's probably something I missed, but uh, again, I'm just going to keep on going on the slide deck because there's a lot to cover. So again, uh, configure the local count for services. So one of the things you want to do is create a local count. So to do the volume maintenance as well as um, configure that later. Here. Uh, again, you probably want to use like a password management system. Uh, we're going to call it create SQL service count and basically what we're going to do is create a local count and um, you can give it specific uh, privileges that you want. Uh, bring up computer management again. That should be able to allow us to do what we need to do. Um, so users, if I was in a rush because we have a limited amount of time, I would figure out exactly what the services you know need to be. But on this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add it to the admin groups. I know it has everything. This is not something I'm advocating for everyday use. Uh, what you can do though is use a strong password, and in the future you can go back to this. I'm going to close this and actually put it in the right groups. There's specific groups that Microsoft has on the MSDN. But I'm going to say the user cannot change a password. Password no expires. And I'm going to hit create. Uh, password. All right. Put in password. Control V. Control V. Great. Password does not meet the policy requirements. Come on. Seriously? This doesn't meet the password. Maybe I have the old one in the buffer. Try this again. Yeah, it must have been the old one. There we go. So now we have account, so SQL service account, right? And groups, and we're going to add to administrators. So add, OK, advance. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find, and we just want to see that account, right? So SQL service account, right? It's a local account. Hit OK. Apply. Hit OK. So everyone knows that when you change over the service accounts, you actually need to do it through configuration manager, OK? So we're going to do that quickly. Cancel. I'm going to get out of SSMS because I'm going to have to reboot everything anyways. So SQL uh, Server Configuration Manager. So let's see if I can push this on the other side at all. And uh, Okay, so on the SQL services, we can see that it's running on a local account, so we want to create and change two of them. We want the agent as well as SQL server to be running on that account. So we're going to browse, and we're going to go back to this account, control C, and control V, check name, hit OK. And of course, it asks us for the password, so this is why it's really handy to have it in something like a notepad. So you can do this twice, hit control, control, hit apply, and basically it's going to say, hey, I want to restart it. And why does it like my password? Maybe because the same thing, it's the old one. Okay. Control C. Control V. Control V. Apply. Yes. Okay, so worst comes to worst if you do something fat fingering. Let's try it again. Go back to computer management account and rechange it. So this is why the doing demos, live demos, is a very risky thing because you always have usual stuff that goes on. So what we can do is I think right click, set password, and proceed. And so control V, control V, hit OK. So that should be the correct password or whatever it is in my buffer, as long as it's big enough. Hit apply. Hit yes. Now this should work. <sighs> Come on. Okay, let's do this. I am going to use Notepad here. Okay, so that is the right password, right? Control C. Okay. Set password. Proceed. Control V. Control V. Okay. Password's been set. So now it's set. 
let's go back to this one. And browse. So advanced by now. So if we go down, we can see this is the service count. Hit check names, hit OK. Now it's asking me for a password. Control V, Control V. Hit OK. Yes. Okay. Well, anyways, <sighs> let's stop it. Stop. Yes. This definitely worked on 2014. Maybe there's something really interesting on 2016. Who knows? But uh, we'll go ahead and do it the old-fashioned way. We're going to stop it. Yeah, for some reason it didn't change it, so now we're going to advance. Then we're going to find going to find it. It's right here at service count. Hit find now. Whoops. Let's double click it. Whoops. Try it again. Wrong one. Browse. Advanced. Find now. The service count. Hit OK. Password. Password. Apply. I know that's the right password. So let's try this. I as das equal 2016 slash count password password apply. That is really weird, Jason. Well, anyways, for some reason uh, it's not allowing me to change the password, so I'm going to start it up. We'll use the old one. Um, I will show you how to put that in. Um, the local policy groups, and we'll move on to the next staff. Uh, so SEC, so S-E-C-P-O-L will bring up your security policy. Oops, S, S E C P O L. Here we go. Try it one more time. S-E-C-P-O-L. Here we go. So this is where you change the local security policy. Again, um, there's some difficulties. I don't know if this is an issue with uh, Azure or just a limited amount of time in which I'm trying to fit too many things in here to show you, but there's a lot of things, again, uh, to do with IaaS. So um, local policies, we can actually go into user right assignments. And so for that, we want to go ahead and do perform volume maintenance. And what we can do is we can do what we just did, which is find now. And this will do your fast file initialization, okay? So hit OK, hit OK. There has to be some type of weird thing going on with SQL because I don't understand. This definitely worked with uh, SQL 2014, so perform volume maintenance. The second one is going to be lock pages in memory, right? And that's right here. Nothing's added to it yet. So advance, find now. And this is going to bring you down to service count. Hit OK, hit OK, and that's it. So what I'm going to do is, since uh, I had some technical difficulties, I'm going to go right to the pre-cut uh, screen images so we can get through the rest of this. So power images we talked about, local service count, uh, volume maintenance, lock pages, configure firewall, right? Database engine is the next thing we want to set up. So we want to configure tempdb files, enables trace flags, resize the max uh, system databases, set min max memory, uh, set to default, data backup directories, always compress backups, optimize for ad hoc queries, set max stop, and enable DAC. There's a lot of tasks here. Um, when I'm done, I'm going to give Jason this whole thing, including all the screenshots, so you can go through it. Um, many of these, like for instance, we talked about configuring Windows, and I should have just went through here and did it this way. It would have been quicker. Um, what should have happened when we change the service count, so if I can find it, change over to local service count, it should have came over and said, hey, you know, SQL 2014 like this. And at the end, when it was done, it should have picked both the service counts, right? Dot slash service count. Uh, for some reason, uh, it didn't do that. But uh, if it did that, then enable file initialization as well as lock pages in memory would work fine. We're going to go through uh, the screenshots um, for setting database uh, uh, mail because, again, we can go through it. Here's the scripts, though. This will help you change your server settings, uh, configure the databases for system, um, determine what your max stop setting is, and 
enable a dedicated administrator connection, okay? So let's talk about each one of these. The dedicated uh, admin connection, when you spin up SQL Server, there's a bunch of schedules, so schedulers, and if everything goes south, and what's going to happen is uh, basically you get thrashing and you're not going to be able to get onto your server. By enabling the dedicated admin, it gives you a backdoor that has always resources. So this might allow you to be able to get in, do SP who to, and kill a process. Okay, so I give you the script here; it basically enables it. Second thing is, one of the things you want to do is look at your CPU. So for instance, like I said last time, uh, I had two CPUs and seven gigs of memory. I think that was like an A4 or something I spun up for this. And what we want to do is we want to set the min-max memory. So what do you set the min-max memory? Well, given seven GB right, for memory, I want to leave some memory for uh, the operating system. So I probably set a side two gigs, right? So maybe I'll set five or four as the th threshold, okay? So five times 1024 would be my max memory. Min memory, what would you say? Hey, maybe your min memory, 1024. Well, that's not what you really want to do. Min memory means that it actually has to get to that value before it actually reserves it. So put it down at 512. That's something that's attainable. Hopefully it's attainable once you pawn boot up with your uh, load and you'll never give that memory up to uh, the OS, which is really good. Next screen. Uh, default properties. Some of the things you want to do is remember we set up the data directory, the log directory, and backup. We definitely want to set those up. If you're using any of the ad hoc commands through like um, SSMS, okay, you definitely want to use compressed backup as a default. Okay. So those are the settings you can choose also. Um, these are some settings I always set on. Optimize for ad hoc uh, workloads. Basically on a workload, um, the problem is is that um, if you get a lot of uh, single queries that come through that are ad hoc, uh, it'll start a whole plan for it. It could uh, take up your memory if you only have seven gigs of memory, if you got lots and lots of them. Uh, having optimized for ad hoc only stores a stub in memory, okay? Since that stub's only in memory, um, it uh, saves your memory and you don't get a plan cache flush, okay? Uh, last two things would be uh, max degree of parallelism. That means how many threads you can run a uh, actual query on, okay, how much parallelism. The interesting thing is that uh, max dot for SharePoint is always one. Interesting thing also is in 2016, you can specify max dot at the database level, so that's awesome because before when you had uh, SharePoint, you had to use SharePoint just for its own instance because you had to set max dot to one. But now you can have max dot for all the SharePoint databases, one, and then set it to something different for another database, okay? As for cost threshold of parallelism, when it does an estimate how long it's going to take, it says if it's greater than 60 seconds and didn't do a parallel plan, if it's possible, if not, uh, do a regular plan, which will be uh, serial. Um, again, you get the determined max stop setting in here, so I'll give you that script. Uh, database growth, okay? Out of the box, tempdb is two files, and it's only eight gigabytes, uh, megabytes for the primary, one for the log, and 10% growth. That's basically going to get you some fragmentation, okay, especially at the VLFs, as well as you're going to get a lot of growth, which is not going to be good for you. Usually I put it to, um, what's his name? Um, it's on my slide deck, too. There is a great presentation by one of the guys from Microsoft, Bob Ward, and it was on the number. So I usually set it to four files, one gigabyte apiece, um, tempdb256, and I think that's shown on the next file. Um, same thing with msdb. I usually set these to, like, 3264. Uh, so 64 file, 32 here, and 32 on growths. Uh, again, you just want to not have fragmentation and hopefully, you know, MSDB shouldn't change too much. It might grow, but if you, it does grow, you don't want fragmentation. Um, TempDB, this again shows me with the four files at 1024, 256 for a log, and they're all grown at the same size. Again, it's really important to grow them at the same size because the way TempDB works, it's a round robin. And so if they grow at different size, it's always going to pick the file that has the most free space. And so um, by having the files grow at the same time, they'll all be, always be equal and it'll do a round robin allocation. And is that the last one? So I think that's the last slide here, right? So tempdb. So next one is installing database mail. Why do you want to install database mail? 
You want to install database mail so you can have wording. So basically, one of the really cool things about um, Azure is the ability to uh, use Azure Marketplace. And one of the things that's out there in Azure Marketplace is uh, the SendGrid. Okay, it's a service, and what it allows you to do is send up to 25,000 emails per month free. So what we want to do is create and activate a SendGrid account, okay, enable the database server, create a mail account, uh, make a mail profile, associate the profiles with accounts, sign the profile to principal, update the credential, uh, credentials for SMTP, so basically where is that SendGrid account, and then basically test it, because otherwise you don't know if learning's working, right? So let's go through the screenshots on that. So the SendGrid account, again, is in Azure Marketplace. You say create new SendGrid account. You need to give it a password, confirm the password. And what it's going to do is you have different levels. F1 is free, so that's what I picked. It asks you to point it to a resource group, put it in the same resource group they spun up the virtual machine. Okay. At this point, what you can do is it asks you to print out, uh, put in some contact information as well as an email. And then you say purchase, but zero dollars. At this point, you have the SendGrid account. If you go ahead and you manage the SendGrid account, it'll give you what the name of the SendGrid account is. And if we go to, I wrote that down in my keys that I has. It's basically, it gives you this Azure weird thing at azure.com. Gives you a password. That's the one that's associated with JMinor. And if you use this as the location, um, you know, the username and password for the mail server for SMTP, it will actually work. So, real cool stuff. So, let's go back to the screenshots. And again, I give you the scripts to actually go ahead and to create account, associate them, and to actually, basically, if you run the SQL, basically at the end you'll have this account. I defaulted it to craftydba at outlook.com because I have an Outlook account for craftydba. I usually put SQL Server in the name of the server, so it changes to SQL 2016. Again, this is the reply email, so you could do same count. SMTP SendGrid.net is the place, but remember that username and password, that's the thing that you pull off that manage, okay? So this is where I put it right in, okay? And at this point, if you sent a test email from SQL Server, guess what? You'd get the email in my mailbox, okay? So mail is very important. If you don't have mail, installed, you can't do alerting. And that basically goes to our next section. I usually put in alerts for um, 11 through uh, 24, okay? I also enable deadlocking, blocking, um, the 823, 824, 825 alerts, as well as, um, say, high CPU or long-running queries you might want to put in there. There's a bunch of uh, monitoring you can also do in Azure, and I'll leave that for you to look into. Um, but again, there's a lot of things you can do once you set it up. But right now we have, you know, um, basically mail working. We can do basic alerting, so we want to add an operator, fail-safe operator. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what a fail-safe operator is, but the fail-safe operator is when MSDB goes on vacation. That's where all your, um, basically, mail information is. And what it does is the sale fail-safe basically puts it into uh, the registry so that um, that information is still available if, for some reason, the disk that MSDB is on goes south. Now, I've actually had that save my cookies in the past when working with SANS with clustering because the clustered resource might, you know, go... Um, you know, patchy, but guess what? I might still have my memory in, uh, because it's a local, you know, physical virtual machine or a physical machine, and so maybe the C drive still there with MSDB, and that'd be great. But uh, once we get the failsafe, we want to nail, uh, enable the SQL agent mail, and to get this to work, you have to just reboot the agent, and once it's done, it should work. And then we can create alerts, test them, and again, blocking, deadlock, and whatever else you want to do. So I'm going to go through the screenshots, but again, I will give Jason all the code. It's all documented. If you have any questions, give me a holler. Uh, basically, this enables alerts. Right here, we're creating an operator called Basic Monitoring. Okay. Uh, when it's all done, we should have every day. We want to get notified all the day. And basically, it's going to go to craftydba.com, who's the um, admin for the uh, operator. And then this is where, if you right-click on the SQL agent properties, okay, and then you go to alert system, this is where you have to click that mail 
profile you just created. If you didn't do this and restart the service, okay, none of the alerts are actually going to come out. So this is a really important step. Uh, you know, again, follow the scripts, get database mail, make sure you get the SendGrid account. Uh, but this is really important because you actually have to uh, enable the profile and to uh, point it and reboot. Also, you want to enable it here to fail safe and say, hey, email basic monitoring, uh, you know, operate if it fails, okay? And again, right here I'm showing you I'm rebooting the service. And then there's a thing called test alert. You give it a number, it will test each one. And we can see this one that we tested alert 16. It came back saying, hey, I tested alert 16. So that means that if there's anything going wrong with your VM in the cloud, you'll be getting these emails, which is awesome because now you know what your cloud, you know, your SQL box is out there. You have some type of monitoring on it. So, um, again, 823, 824, 825, uh, 10 just informational, so you never want to enable that, but I just left it in there, so it's always disabled. And 11 through 24 is the most important ones to look at. And again, you test each one just to make sure alerting's done. So once we have alerting, what's the last thing? Provide maintenance plans, right? And so we'll go over that quickly. Okay. Provide maintenance plans. One of the things you want to do is you want to do data file backups. And again, it depends on how big your system is. I did a virtual chapter uh, talk on all hologram scripts, so you can look at that. It's for database fundamentals. I did it about two years ago. Um, but again, the scripts are here. I'm using hologram scripts, but then you know, what I'm doing is I'm creating the jobs automatically. So if we went over here and we ran this install.bat job, right? So if we edit, guess what? It's calling SQL command and it's doing each one. So it's installing, you know, hologram script. Uh, basically, I have a script that maintains MSDB actually cleans out DB. I have a script that I wrote personally for monitoring database files so that, you know, if you say, hey, I want always 15% free space, and if it goes below, it'll email you. Same thing with VLFs. I don't want more than 200 VLFs. It'll email you. Um, I get those jobs right here, so for the servers, and I got a cleanup job for history, which I talked about. And then these right here, these set of four, check integrity, full log, and optimize for system as well. Same thing for user. I just using all the hologram scripts, which is really cool. You got the jobs automatically set up for you. Push a button, you run this, and guess what? Now you just have to point to, go into each one and point to what disk you want to start on. It's all done for you. In fact, if, when doing best practices and everything goes well, like tonight I had a few hiccups, um, this is something that's a half an hour task, if, if that, and it's pretty quick. So, um, yeah, so once you get those in place, you're guaranteed that you're not going to lose your job because, you know, you don't have a backup file to go to. Again, I would make sure that, uh, you know, um, maybe use a different storage account, something that you can look into uh, when attaching those disks for the backup. So, you you know, you, again, you're segregating stuff out to different places in Azure. So if something goes wrong, uh, not all your cookies in one place. Um, so, again, we talked about maintenance plan. Last thing to wrap this up, get your current baseline. A lot of people don't stress this enough, and again, I want to talk about it. Again, the modern DBA should be something called DMAIC, and DMAIC is a uh, Six Sigma, uh, you know, concept, but it's basically you define a problem. So basically the problem is, is that we want to uh, have good uptime, and so what we do is we measure what the uptime is so we can get IAPs on the disk. So, and below some tools that are free out there you can do. For instance, Crystal Disk Marks out there, SQLIO, they both give you benchmarks on the disk. Uh, if you're curious about how your system's doing over, say, a day, you can go ahead and do the performance analysis of the locks. And what it does is it runs a system monitor script. It could be white quite huge, and what I usually do is I start to a text file and use some PowerShell to just script out the time frame that I'm interested in, say maybe a peak time of the day, and now I know what my peak time of the day is, and I have a baseline, so if something goes wrong, like, oh my god, someone complains, and I run an analysis of the log, and it's like, hey, wow, it's totally really bad, then I can get into the improve things, and start looking for why it's wrong. And then I can make a change, maybe move it to another server, or add more memory, or change, uh, you know, the disk, you know, the actual VM size. And then control would be to actually 
make sure you know the user is okay with it, and then do it again. So again, three through four, uh, six are basically things that you can use to actually uh, do baselines of your system. So PAL's really good it's out in Coplex. PS Diag and SQL Diag both on Com Coplex. SQL Nexus is out there. After DMV information, and again, I'm sure Jason Strait will tell you this, but Glenn get Barry's out there. He has awesome scripts on the DMVs, and those are all things that you want to do to get a baseline. Again, I wish I had more time on this. Um, this presentation is probably a good two-hour presentation uh, if everything's going well in Azure and nothing's going wrong. Um, let's do some fun stuff. I know I've been all down and technical, so I cannot complete a presentation without doing a little Dilbert. So, uh, of course, I'm not going to get any feedback of anyone laughing, but, um, you know, migrating workloads to Azure and basically, you know, Dilbert's friend says, I migrated on Northern Data Center to the cloud, but the cloud stopped working and I cannot find the number for the cloud guide, right? He lost our data center and he's like, well, that's one way to look at. But uh, really, Azure is more resilient than this con comic strip. Um, you have to look at pricing and make sure that, um, you know, um, it's great for small to medium-sized businesses uh, that are new or existing. You can get rid of your uh, data set in the closet, put it into a system. Uh, there's, um, take a look out there. There's some uh, videos on the Azure data sets. They're pretty awesome. I mean, they're basically, you know, they got cargo containers with these uh, cheap and expensive servers that they spin up, and when something goes dead, they just turn the system off, and they migrate your uh, server to another system, and they do stuff that small to medium businesses cannot do, okay? Uh, for large size businesses, take a look at it also. It just might uh, make sense with, uh, you know, either expanding your data center or maybe cutting costs in the long run. Uh, to summarize this talk, what we talked about is to be successful with infrastructure as a service, you need to know a little about the virtual machine. So we have to go into Azure Portal and do something. You have to know something about Windows systems, right? You have to do disk, you have to format them, you have to do uh, user accounts, policy groups, all that fun stuff. Uh, but why do we want to do this? Well, you have the benefit of controlling 100% of the system. So you have a one-to-one -one, uh, for on-premise to in-cloud co compatibility. So and what this means is that if you're using file groups or file table or some esoteric feature of SQL that's not supported in Azure SQL database, guess what? You can do it in SQL Server on iOS, okay? And again, make sure that you take a baseline because noisy neighbors are out there. I'm going to go quickly over um, the links just for the uh, webcast. So he has a link on uh, virtual machine sizes, so it's just the size that are currently out there, they're always changing it. This is the white paper that I got the, most of the information from. It's from the Azure Group, uh, Performance Best Practices. Um, there's a link on premium storage, how much it costs and size. Um, there's a white paper on disk partition alignment best practices. This is kind of old. So alignment is kind of old, but the formatting is still valid, okay? Uh, Managing availability. So this is talking about uh, availability groups. Um, SendGrid is a link. Um, my own blog, I got some of this, and some of the scripts I already had there, you can just go take a look at. System alerts, database mail, how to set it up. Operators, how to set it up. Alerts, how to set it up. Uh, TechNet has a great article on min-max memory. Uh, another article from TechNet on uh, optimize for ad hoc workloads. Uh, optimizing TempDB. This was, uh, I think, from Simple Talk, but I think it has a reference to uh, Bob Wood's presentation at Pass, which was an awesome presentation. Okay, it tells you how to stop with four and uh, you know ramp up to eight, and that sweet spots between four and eight files. Um, you know, I recently came across a client who had one file per every processor and had 24 files out there for TempDB, which was kind of crazy. One of the things I didn't talk about, but you can do, uh, Brent has talked about it too in a blog, is uh, the flags 117, 118. That means um, to grow all uh, extents at the same time. And um, second one is, uh, no, all files at the same time. Another one is to actually allocate uh, extents and set pages. Uh, dedicated administrator connection might get you out of uh, a tight spot in the future. 
Remember I talked about how you can take a bunch of disks and make a storage space and get more IOPS? That's storage space. So that's the only way you can do. Um, right now they've upped the size of disk that you can add, but there is definitely a limit to the size of disk you can add to a VM, say like one terabyte. And so if you want that huge uh, disk, then um, you can go ahead and, um, you know, do a storage space and take 64 disks and make it one storage space. I know there's a question out there called what are all the hologram scripts and there's definitely a link there. I will be coming down to that pretty soon. High performance power settings. So this is the high performance power settings, Brent Ozar, maintenance scripts. This is the all the hologram backup scripts. Uh, there's that free script I talked about for database VLFs. There's monitoring database file size with another link to my blog, maintenance history and uh, cleanup text, uh, another link to my blog. Uh, the management data warehouse. This is something that uh, yeah, again, 2016 definitely uh, makes uh, some of these things uh, easier. Um, it tells you about 10 dB size. There's still a lot of people using uh, the older versions uh, even before 2016 came out, what, two weeks ago. So I gave this presentation in uh, April and I was used in 2014. But, um, a lot of people don't use a data management warehouse, and it's out there, and it's free, and you can configure it to do a lot of things, so definitely take a look at it. I think it's an underutilized uh, aspect of SQL Server Flow that most people don't use. The last set of things, the performance analysis logs, Crystal Dismark, SQL IO, SQL Nexus, and uh, Glenberry's DMVs are very important. That's for your baseline. So again, I wish uh, the demo gods were a little more uh, friendly to me tonight. I appreciate uh, the people that stayed for the whole presentation. Uh, thanks for your time. And again, Jason, thank you for having me tonight to talk. I will uh, get you the slide deck as well as all the uh, attached material, and uh, you can post it. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, John, for uh, presenting tonight. And thank you all for attending. Uh, see you at the next meeting. Awesome. Hey, Jason, you still there? Yeah, I'm just trying to...